search of our cosmic origins. Located high in the Andes mountain range, the 66 antennas that make up the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, are an imposing sight. Under one sky, more than 20 countries embark upon a scientific endeavor that can only be realized through collaboration. North America, Europe, East Asia, and Chile work together to answer humankind's fundamental questions. Northern Chile was chosen as the site for ALMA because the Atacama Desert is the driest in the world. Its atmosphere, almost devoid of water vapor, enables detection of some of the faintest signals from the universe. Over 16,500 feet above sea level and covering distances of up to 10 miles of the Chachnantor Plateau, the ALMA antennas work as a single large telescope. A supercomputer combines and synchronizes all of their signals in real time. Thanks to this engineering and scientific feat, we're learning about the cold universe, the secrets of planet formation, and the chemical elements that constitute the building blocks of life. Professionals from around the world work for ALMA, pushing the limits of knowledge every day. In Chile, about 50 staff members are based in Santiago, while another 200 work in shifts at the operations support facility close to the town of San Pedro de Atacama. Most of the staff works in the offices, laboratories, and antenna control room of this facility at an altitude of 9,500 feet. Others ascend to the Chachnantor Plateau at 16,500 feet to maintain and relocate the antennas, among other tasks. Strict safety protocols are crucial under these conditions. Thanks to leisure and residential facilities, staff can lead a healthy lifestyle, playing sports and games, watching movies, enjoying nutritious meals, and resting in comfort. Alma plays a key role in global astronomical efforts. Along with other radio telescopes, it allowed the first image of a black hole to be captured. Without ALMA, that goal would have been unattainable. The Chilean astronomical community actively participates in ALMA research and discoveries using its 10% of observing time. The radio telescope also contributes to workforce development and supports national and regional scientific, technological, and outreach projects. An example of the latter are the thousands of visitors who tour the facilities each year. ALMA respects the local Liganantai or Atacameño indigenous culture, supporting educational and other projects in the town of Toconao in San Pedro de Atacama, preserving archaeological heritage sites, and protecting the unique flora and fauna of the region, to name a few initiatives. Mirroring the antennas that work in unison with one goal, under the same sky, the international collaboration that ALMA embodies continues the search of our cosmic origins. Hi everyone, welcome to this live. My name is Thais Mandiola. I'm a visitor coordinator at the observatory. Thank you for joining us today. We'll have a great guest who will help us to understand more about the ALMA antennas, how they work and their maintenance at 5,000 meters. It's important to clarify though, 
that at this moment, no visits are allowed to the observatory due to the pandemic, of course. And Alma isn't working at this moment 100%, but our interviewees will tell us a little bit more about this, okay? Let me tell you uh, a little bit more about ALMA and the antennas. Currently, around 250 or 60 people work in ALMA, as it was mentioned in the video. And it's important to say that 80% of the staff are Chilean and 65% work at the OSF uh, in the north of Chile. The area that you saw in the video was where we live in when we're on shift in the residence a place that gathers the rooms with private bathrooms, the dining room, the gym, recreation areas, and even a swimming pool, as you saw in this video. ALMA has a total of 66 antennas. 54 of them are 12 meter diameter, as seen in the video now, and 12 of them are seven meter in diameter. The radio telescope combines the signals coming from each one of them, working as an interferometer. That is a single giant dish or telescope the size of the entire, entire array. These perfect parabolic shapes of a precision equivalent to just a fraction of the thickness of a human hair, it makes them one of the most accurate antennas in the world. Unlike a telescope that is built and remains in the same location, these antennas are strong enough to be moved between various paths. Those are the triangles that you see in the videos. Those are the paths. They position the antennas there and they can move them with these big, huge trucks. They're called the transporters, okay? Um, they're specially designed for these antennas and they reposition them according to the observations that are need to be carried out. Okay. Also, they don't need to be protected by a dome or any structure. These reflectors are really exposed to very extreme conditions at the high site and um, facing strong winds, fluctuating temperatures between 20 and minus 20 Celsius degrees, and even snow. And now we're having some of it up on the high side. We'll, we'll see what our guests tell us about this. Okay, so now let me introduce you our guests. That will be, um, it's really the time to listen to other voices from ALMA. Uh, we're being joined today by specialists on the antennas and their maintenance. This will be Fabiola Cruzat. Uh, she's a, one of our supervisors from the antenna maintenance group. And Mark Galilee is our technical mechanical lead. So now we can see them on screen. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hi, everyone. I'm good. Thank you. Mm. Yourself, Thais? I'm good. Yeah. So you're talking to us from the UK. I How's am. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Very far away. How is everything yeah. there? Um, it's OK at the moment. Um, yeah, I guess we're all in a pandemic situation. So we're doing the it's best to work from home. and. Yeah, and the other hand, we have Fabiola Cruzat. She's, um, I said, our supervisor from the Antenna Maintenance Group. And well, she's having a little bit of trouble to connect as we see. But well, let's talk about the antennas, Mark. Um, how has been the process of recovering them? Because now, because of the pandemic, more than a half of a year, it was really stopped and closed. How was this recovery process for, for you guys? Uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, well, uh, ob obviously we've never had this situation before, so that was the first mm -hmm. worry. Um, so uh, actually, when we while we were working from home, um, there was a lot of thought going into how we were going to recover the antennas. Um, one of the things they haven't been without uh, at the high site is power. So. Um, during the winter that we had, uh, we had to think about how we're going to protect the antennas to stop snow entering into areas where it's going to cause damage. Um, so that was one of the things which uh, the caretaker team on site, which was a small team of specialists to maintain um, 
the vital services on site while the while the observatory was closed. Um, and the other thing between um, all of the all of the team, we we were planning uh, the inspections, um, what we needed to check beforehand um, to make sure that everything was safe to start up. Uh, and obviously, when a big system like this has been out for a while, you can imagine uh, things like um, the bearings we we were looking at, you know, um, they've been out, out of service for a year. So how do you get them back into service? We have to think about the greasing um, and extra maintenance that is not actually part of the, the maintenance that we do normally. Um, mm -hmm. But to, to discuss with all the stakeholders and see how we were going to get the systems, uh, the antennas started back up. So I think it was a, a long process and it went through quite a few stage gates to make sure we were ready. Um, uh, and as you said, uh, actually we have we have snow now, which is um, a, again a difficult time for the people on site. Um, but I think overall the return has gone quite well, and, and maybe Fabiola um, can can give an update on that from yeah. her point of view as well. Hi, Fabiola. You you were able <laughs> Hi, Mark, to connect. Hi, us. Yes. Uh... Yes, I we came back last week from there the at the 5,000 meter. It was snowing. We had like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, we have uh, we, the recovery of the antenna itself was, uh, as Mark indicated, easier than we thought, likely. But uh, after that, we recovered all the antennas and now we have a big snowstorm. So now, now it has been a lot of recovery and opening the road to access the antennas themselves. And uh, so far, the observatory is working. It's working good, and we are we are doing the observation with forty-two antennas and uh, seven meter the seven meter Japanese antennas. So Great. everything is working much much better than than expected. And this week, we are hoping to do some relocation with the transporter that you were just showing on the cameras. That's amazing because from the 66, you were able to really recover 42 of them in a short time, really, because it hasn't been that many months now. So they really survived that time they were shut yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, actually, we, we recovered all of them, but some, as always, some antennas have some minor issues that well, that's why they are one, not 100% and that's why we don't use them for observation. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, one of them is at the OSAF at the 3,000 meter doing a, a preventive uh, uh, maintenance that it was programmed, so it's not unexpected. And the 7 meter antennas are not uh, being used, two of them, because we have uh, some unexpected problem and, and another two. 12 meter also one unexpected problem, but so far better than much better than expected. They are very robust mechanisms. They are telescopes. They are very robust. Yeah. So well, after having this update of how's the actual situation of the observatory now, I would like if you can tell the people, the viewers, a little bit of your background, how you got to Alma, uh, how was that? road to get to Alma and you're actually duties during the time that you're making the shift at the high site or the OSF. So if you could start, Mark, please. Yeah, um, thanks, Thais. So my, my background actually is uh, with, uh, I've worked in similar big projects, but never anything so extreme. Um, uh, and actually, um, I finished one project, which was in Switzerland. Um, my family wanted to move back to the UK um, after we had my, my son. Um, but I actually, uh, from my side, I was still looking for a, a real challenge of these big projects. Uh, and I saw the application for Alma, and I thought, it's just amazing, you know, uh, the location, um, the challenges. And, you know, so far, that's really lived up to expectations. Um, uh, I mean, this year has been a really big challenge, and I think the whole team has kind of come together to to, to fulfill that. Um, yeah, I think it's just been amazing so far. Um, and my day-to-day -day role um, is basically in terms of the antennas, I'm sort of a, a mechanical lead, which means that um, in terms of the collaboration, which is worldwide, um, I have to work 
uh, with internal collab collaborators within Alma, um, interface with the external collab collaborators around the world. And the idea is to make sure that uh, we're doing um, the correct maintenance, mechanical maintenance on the antennas, but also other systems. Um, and to check that we're optimizing the maintenance um, to make sure we have enough spares to foresee the, the future maintenance and how we're going to continue operations for many more years. Um, and then any corrective problems, uh, big corrective problems, um, I, I generally have to bring the people together externally, internally to try and solve them um, as a team. So that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, my, my role. Um, also, I'm part of the, the on-site brigade, which is kind of an emergency oh, yeah. brigade, brigade um, yeah. which is kind of like a voluntary um, team. Yeah. Yes, amazing task. And how about you, Fabiola? How did you get to Alma? And how long you've been working? And what are your functions I in the observatory? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't know if you are seeing me or not because the internet is really, really bad here. Yeah, at this moment. You. No worries. Okay, we are. I have been uh, now. It's going to be fourteen years in Alma. I had the chance to arrive when nothing existed there, so I could uh, see the the assembly on the antenna and I participate on the team that uh, did the reception of the antennas at itself and also the the equipment, the receivers that go inside the antennas. And this was very, very interesting because I was after a part of the instrument group where I had the chance to work with the cryostat. I don't this know if what we're seeing in the video everybody now. knows, but Alma have uh, this blue in the video now. This is called the front end. Inside mm -hmm. we are we have 10 bands that the reception of the waves of the universe. That one is the call, a call head. That is the, the, the thing that allows us to reach 4 Kelvin minus 269 Celsius and uh, at this moment we have 10 bands here at this moment we are integrating the last one band 10 so I have been in the process where we start from zero now ending with the last integration of the last band and uh, I'm, I'm with Mark in the mechanical team so we are in the most fun team of the observatory Definitely. where all the action get <laughs> where we can assemble everything from the smallest screw on the cryostat to the biggest screw on the transporter. Mm -hmm. So I will say that we are the lucky one here. <laughs> yeah, and so people know that See, actually people. there are more engineers working on site than astronomers, no? They're taking care of all the antennas and their maintenance and moving them. Yeah, I cannot hear you were because of the internet, but yeah, we, we interact with the with the astronomers, with the software people, with the, the operators, we with everybody. We are a small team, but we have to work all together to reach uh, the, the good performance of the observatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Can so you hear me? yeah, we we're, we're hearing you. Um for any of you really, if we go more into detail, if you can tell us more about, you already told us about the cryostat and the front, the front end, but there are more components in the antennas, no? If you can tell us a little bit more about what are these components of the antennas so people can learn about this. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> yeah. You can tell about the ditches yeah, there. Um, so you, you can see the, the kind of the large dish. Um, basically, you have two mirrors. So the, the primary mirror and the, sec the secondary mirror, the large dish is where the radio signal comes in. At the top, you have a secondary mirror, uh, which you can sort of move. Um, and then that, that then takes the radio signal down into the antenna. Uh, and that's where you see um, what uh, Fabiola described as the front end. Yeah. which has very various different radio receivers which are cooled to almost absolute zero so pretty much one of the coldest places in the universe um and that those receivers can then take that radio signal um to to the kind of the processing units of almo the correlator which correlates the signals uh between all of the different antennas um and Basically, for, for the antenna themselves, we have to be able to move um, 
to point to a signal uh, to where we want to image. And you can do this on uh, basically big uh, bearings, which uh, either move the tip system, the antenna in rotation, mm -hmm. or, or they move them in elevation. Um, so this is kind of uh, how, how we point the antenna at the, at, at the signal. Uh, the the source um, uh, and and basically all the antennas as you saw in the video can move in unison um, to to keep on track of that source um, with some clever control systems and obviously as you mentioned Thais the the precision of each antenna can can basically focus in on one tiny point in the universe that you want to uh, take the radio signal from and do the imaging. <laughs> Um, and we need to keep the antennas very stable, uh, so they have um, ha uh, very precise climate systems, uh, which keep um, the temperature stable. Um, so if you can imagine, you want, you've got a huge steel structure, um, sometimes carbon as well. Uh, you want to be able to keep that stable, so you have to keep it nicely climate controlled, um, so that you can uh, get your precision images back from that radio source that you're looking at. That is for the inside of the antenna, no? Like an air yes, conditioner. The, yeah, so the, basically like an air conditioner. Yeah, and how how hot it gets inside? Is it a, a stable at what temperature? I think it's at like 18 degrees, like no? 18, yeah, 18, 18 the degrees, average. Yeah. And outside you can get minus we 30. We can have more oh. than one. The winds, they are very, very strong. We're talking about 100 kilometers per hour of wind, no? So. Uh, the time that this antenna shut down is when they get over how many kilometers per hour or many meters per second? 20 meters per second, 18 meters per second, depending on the model of the often, Then you have to stop your work outside, no? Like too often. Too often for the astronomer, let's say, because whatever yeah. interferes with the observation is too often. <laughs> yeah, winter time. Last week we have like uh, I don't know three days of the week with this really bad bad weather. But this is because we are in winter here in the south hemisphere, and also in in Chile we suffer in Alma we suffer from the Bolivian winter. winter yeah. We call it, and it's in January February. So. Then also we have a few weeks of bad weather. Yeah, I, I wanted to refer case, what you were showing. Yeah, go huh? ahead. Go ahead. In, in the video, they were showing the assembly of the dishes of the antennas, and it's very interesting for the note for the people to know that the, the radio of these dishes have, is, is extremely uh, accurate, and we don't have more than. 12 millimeters of difference between each point. And that's allowed us to have a very, very clear reception of the of the waves. So this is a really big instrument, 100 ton heavy, but uh, act in a very, very accurate way. They have to deal, as you mentioned, with the, the wind, with the with the with the, the bad the temperature, yeah. Weather, very cold temperatures to that. We're higher temperature in daytime, 10 degrees in summertime. And we have to keep uh, the, the, the formation in such a way that the, that, that, uh, that the reception is very accurate. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of mechanisms in the antenna to allow us to, 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 to maintain this accuracy. Of, well, going into reception. that, you're mentioning by the structure of the antenna. If you can tell us a little bit more of your daily maintenance work, that could be, for example, that, that you just mentioned, that would be to have the panels aligned. What else is like the daily maintenance that you can tell our viewers that you do for the antenna? <laughs> Nothing really, really special. We have to just follow the, the manufacturer recommendation, and they are mostly about uh, visual inspection, filter replacement, oil and grease replacement uh, for the ele electrical cabinets, also uh, inspection and measurements. But uh, it's not a rocket science. <laughs> it's a very normal work. It's just done at five.
5,000 meters. But I will say, uh, so you, you, don't, you don't want to forget your tools. We have to use your oxygen because you, you become a little bit dummy if you don't use the oxygen. So we use oxygen, we have to have winter clothes all the time. And then uh, it's normal standard uh, maintenance every three months, six months, yearly, as the, the manufacturer recommended. And for the manufacturer, uh, you, you have three different uh, types, no? If you can tell us a little bit of these differences between the antennas that we have. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. We're, we're, yeah. Well, actually, it's four, three different manufacturers, four different types of antennas. Um, yeah, so we have um, two, uh, two from J Japan, which is one mm -hmm. of our collaborators. Um, so seven meter and 12 meter dish antenna types. Um, and they're uh, directly driven antennas, so um, direct drive on the uh, elevation and the azimuth. Uh, we have one type, which is 12 meter dish from uh, North America. And these are sort of uh, gearbox type driven. And we have uh, one type from Europe and they're uh, direct, directly driven. Um, so they, they all have very, uh, differences. Uh, and actually it's, it's very difficult as, um, I think, think Fabiola was kind of underselling the maintenance. Um, so it, it's very difficult because we have the four different types, we have four different maintenance procedures. Yeah. Um, uh, and also I think, well, for me at least, um, the, the 5,000 meters is very, very difficult to, I mean, it, it is kind of normal maintenance procedures. Um, but I think that really adds the difficulty to it, the safety, um, as Fabiola mentioned, we have oxygen. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a, a very dif difficult environment to work in. Yeah, if you could tell us a little bit, uh, how is the routine to go up to the high side? Like when you start your morning, what do you have to do to actually like the protocols to get through and go to the high side and work up there? Because the viewers, they actually don't know, but if you can tell us so they can learn also, how is that? Please. Uh, first of all, you have to have a good breakfast and get prepared for a very, very cold day. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go to the poly, poly clinic and your levels are checked so you are in a health, you are healthy because if you have a minor issue as a cold, that's it, you're not yeah. allowed to go up. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you have to go through safety to the um, security check to see if your, your track is according to, to uh, ascend to the road. And of course, the, the, the day before, Everybody prepared their tools, their procedures, and all the, the, the consumables or the spare that they will use for their maintenance. So this is not decided in the morning. We, we have a, a working plan uh, through the month, so everybody knows in advance what is supposed to, to, to do every every day. Mm -hmm. So normally the day before, everybody have heard their, their, their tools and their procedures, procedures ready to go. And then we have to keep uh, radio communication all the time. Once you arrive to the building, you have to check with, and again with the polyclinic, again with safety and your supervisors, and then you request the antenna where you're going to work. Because uh, you, have, you must remember also that these antennas can be used, and sometimes are used or moved from around the world. So you don't want to just go in the antenna and somebody from from Germany will be moving your antenna. <laughs> so everything is very clear how, how you have to work and, and proceed. Yeah, and from the uh, as mentioned before, the condition. Sorry. No, I just wanted to mention really that. Yeah, from the OSEF, we have the operators. 40, 40 minutes. So driving. there we I'm ask sorry. the operators. They, they are going to coordinate. Mm -hmm. Go, Fabiola. Sorry, we were stop. overlapped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, my internet is, is really, really bad, so I cannot understand what you say. This happens and, for, for and, the and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the things there that you you always before going out you check how the weather is because uh, we are we are here in in the Cordillera de los Andes, and, and uh, we know in advance, but uh, sometimes when a storm is coming, so you always have to be aware 
what is the situation? Is here you're going to have a clear, windy, cold day, it's okay, or you are going to have maybe a storm coming soon? Because uh, when, when a storm is coming, uh, actually, me, I am a supervisor, so I, I always uh, I tell the guys we have a safety meeting in the morning, a safety talk, and then we are all aware that we have to have to be by radio connected in Channel C and, and uh, checking if we need to, to abandon the site, if a storm is coming or not. And if not, if everything is going okay, the, f the first day that we arrive to the, the, the AOS, we are allowed to work only four hours for healthy reasons. Okay. The second yeah. day, you can work six hours. And the third by the third day of the shift, you can work eight hours. And then no more than eight hours for the rest of the shift. Uh, and then, then that's it. And that's it, yeah. As we see here in the images, we see that it's a very big space that Alma is located, no? So we have different paths, over 290 or something like that, if you can tell me, yeah, if I'm mistaken, the paths. And you, you also work in this of relocating the antennas throughout the array, no? If you can tell us a little bit more about that. The relocation. <laughs> Do you want to go, Fabiola? Uh, actually, I, I mean, Fabiola works um, sort of uh, on a really on a day-to-day -day basis with the relocations at the high sites. Mm -hmm. um, from my side, I, I work um, more with the transporter and um, the maintenance and this side of it. Uh, the relocation is actually quite special. Um, I mean, you've basically got this hundred-ton, twenty-meter by ten-meter machine. Um, over 100 tons actually picking up more than 100 tons antenna so you've got more than 200 tons um, of equipment having to move from one location to another um, and it takes you know it seems seems like okay it's an easy procedure you pick up an antenna and move it but it's not um, there are a lot of uh, procedures to go through you have to disconnect the antenna from uh, the electrical connection at the pad um, you need to move um, the connection to the correlator where, where the, the signal is being correlated to another pad. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of work in the background, a lot of work in the in the foreground that goes on. Um, but yeah, the, the relocation. I think maybe we saw it earlier in the video. It's um, the transporter comes in. Uh, you have some hydraulic rams that lift the transporter up. Um, you kind of pick the antenna up on two kind of uh, ears, which stick out of the side, mm -hmm. um, and then lift uh, up again uh, higher onto the transporter by some more hydraulic rams. Uh, the back ones lift up, and the whole system drives off. <laughs> so, you know, for my, I remember my first um, my interview actually at Alma when I saw this process. It was just amazing. <laughs> Um, it's an impressive machine. Really yeah, yeah, yeah it's, Lorde, they're impressive. Lorde, and Lorde and Otto, that, yeah. Yeah, that takes one day, no, to move a whole antenna from one path to another because of all the protocols that you have to get through. Uh, it can be done around half a day, um, but it depends mm -hmm. on the distance of the pads. As you said, it's quite a big, um, it, like fifteen kilometers distance. It can be uh, for the antennas to be moved, mm -hmm. so. If you're moving them within within the center, which is only maybe a few hundred meters, that, that can be done in say half a day. But uh, a long relocation, as we call it, um, that takes maybe a whole day for the antenna to be moved from one place to another. Great. So I don't know if we have any questions from the public or viewers. If you want to ask something for Mark or Fabiola. Here we have one from Rodrigo Cortez. Is there, is there any plans to increase the amount of antennas? Um, I, I mean, there are, there are up, upgrade plans for many more years. Um, in, in terms of antennas, I, I know we've looked at this. Um, I, I don't know how um, serious that could be in, in the coming years, but uh, it's certainly something that has been considered uh, and, and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you rely on national weather report or have your own measurement stations? Uh, so we use, um, I think it's the Shackman Tor um, 
weather report, weather station uh, weather station yeah um for for the the weather report but uh, i mean um it, it varies on it really on a daily basis um so we can have uh, wind one day um so in the next day it's uh it's yeah uh, it's really from a day-to-day -day basis we have to check check that before we yeah, go it's very fast it's, up there. yeah it's very important to uh for the team beforehand to plan uh, the day before what, what we expect the weather's yeah. going to be like mm -hmm. more questions i don't know if we have from our viewers when will it be open to the public? Well, as stated in the beginning, we, we don't have a date for this yet because of the COVID. Um, hopefully we'll start running our public visits next year if the situation allows it, but we don't have a date yet for opening for the public. Let's see if we have another one from Herald Bunechi. Hi, can optical observation be constructed in that large field without interfering with ALMA? Any of you have a answer to this? Um, I well, I think the only thing that could interfere is uh, we, we're really um, careful with anything that can emit radio frequencies. Um, I, I, in terms of the question, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, there are small observatories close by. Um, I think some of them may be optical, um, but I, I don't know mm -hmm. is the answer. Uh, but I don't see any reason why um, yeah. one couldn't be constructed as long as it's not interfering with the radio frequencies of ALMA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nicolas Lira is one of our, from the EPO team, he's saying that there is actually a, an observatory optical one being constructed up there too so i from my understanding is that they don't interfere with alma in that observation mm -hmm. um i don't know if we have more questions uh, in that case well i wanted to ask you if you have any special anecdote from working at the high side or during your time in alma that you have like a strong memory of you can share with us Uh, Fabiola, that, that to me or Fabiola first. <laughs> Maybe one of the musicians that visit us or um, the animals. I don't know any anecdote, special one that you have. The, 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 I mean, the, there are plenty, plenty of memories because it's really, mm -hmm. really impressive to work in an observatory like that. From because uh, just to see when the first antenna was, was uh, carried out of the hangar by the transporter, that make me, <laughs> you know, I don't know how you say it in English, but it's very impressive. And mm -hmm. then, as mentioned. Uh, before uh, working at the 1,000 meters and 30 of this, uh, 40 of this instrument moving at the same time like ballerinas is marvelous, yeah. really, really marvelous and impressive. And when you see how an astronomer uh, talk to you and explain to you what he he's uh, studying and how f how happy they are with with what uh, what Alma is is giving to them. You just feel proud of it, uh, and it, that it, that pay off for everything, for all the the cold, for all the the, <laughs> the, the high altitude, the, the time you have spent there. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of many good memories that the time we share together as a team because we live half half of our life life up there, and we have people like Mark from from Europe, people from Japan, us the Chile, and we are all different. Uh, but we we all are working for the same goal, and we are really a close team. So it's very uh, an amazing experience to work in Alma. Definitely. Well, we have a question here. Maybe Fabiola can answer. What did you do before working at Alma to get you there, and how can others get such a fantastic job? Thomas <laughs> Kerwin. <laughs> Personally, I study. I went to the university for mechanical engineer, and then uh, before Alma, I was working in a in a, a airline, mm -hmm. and uh, I travel also a lot around the world. So I had the chance to speak English, French, Spanish. That also helped the language, and uh, I don't know, maybe just being lucky to apply and 
<laughs> got the job. Got the job. <laughs> I don't know what you, <laughs> Mark. Uh, sorry, the same question to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I worked, um, well, in, in Switzerland for a little bit uh, on a, a project um, there, uh, the accelerator that's there. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, came back to England. Um, uh, and actually, I, you know, I really like the big science projects from working there. Uh, and actually, Alm was fantastic. Um, so uh, I saw the position and just thought instantly, you know, it, it's an amazing job, as Thomas said, uh, you know, it's it, it's absolutely fantastic to work here. Um, um, uh, and yeah, I think um, in terms of maybe advice to that, just just have a look on the website. Um, uh, the that's what, that's what I was doing. So, um, you know, I think that, that would be my right. advice. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, have a look what's available. Look at your experience and skills, and uh, yeah, you can go on our go website like <laughs> yeah. every day <laughs> for the chance. Okay, so it was fantastic having you guys. Thank you for joining us today um, and answering all the these doubts that we're having about the antennas, their maintenance, and clearing this information for Alma viewers and helping us to understand more about Alma. Uh, I want to let you know that we will have another virtual tour on July 15, and it will be about the correlator this time, the subject. Okay, so please join us for our viewers for that date. Thank you very much, and I'll see you then, okay? So thank you, Mark and Fabiola. Thank you, Thais. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Muy bien. Gracias. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.